What is up everybody? This is Mike with Tiny Life Big Mission and this week in the Word we are covering how to be born again. Grab your word and let's jump in. Welcome back to This Week in the Word. This segment of the channel focuses on a weekly Bible study where we share truth based on what the Word of God says. If you have questions about God or if you are seeking truth, we welcome you and hope to be a good resource for your personal studies. Just want to give a quick thank you to all those newcomers, all of our returning subscribers, and all of our prayer warriors out there for all the support that you've given us. Uh, we also want to welcome and thank the haters and trolls that are out there. We hope that your time here is helpful for you and profitable. Uh, to your learning, to your understanding, and to your growth. On the channel, we have five guiding principles to help you understand our position and how to interact with us. We are here to improve our relationship and our knowledge of God, and we do this first by studying and reading the Word of God. Second point is that we seek truth and not an argument. If your opinion or your belief is more important to you than what the Word of God says, then this channel is probably not going to be a good fit for you. There are things in the Bible that are not 100% clear, and in those areas, we can reason about what the Word of God says, and it's okay if we disagree. If what I say offends you, please don't be overcome by emotions. Consider what I've said and take it to the Word. If what I've said that offends you doesn't match the Bible, then I was wrong and I apologize. But if what I said does match the Bible, then it's not me that you're offended with, it's the Bible. And and I would recommend you taking a look at uh, the Word in your heart and lining up with the Word of God. Third, we are Bible believers. What this means is that we believe the Word of God. It is our authority in all matters of life and the foundation of our faith. To be a Bible believer, you don't have to believe as I do. The King James only is the Word of God. But you must reverence the Word of God as it is just that, your final authority. What this means is that you believe that the words that are in the Bible are the words God himself chose to give us as his creation. We believe that God's words are per pure and perfect just as he is. His words are an attribute of him. Therefore, if there are any errors, mistakes, or changes made to a version of the Bible that can be proven, then we know it's not the word of God. When you study this out, you see that every new copyright of the Bible changes words, changes the meanings of words, so you should be seeking which version is without error and truly the Word of God. I believe the Bible that is without error is the King James Bible, but if you disagree with that, it's okay. We can disagree and you can still glean and learn from this channel. The fourth point is that we are non-denominationalist and non-religious. What this means is that there's tons of doctrine that is taught uh, around the world is truth, but it's erred teachings, and those erred teachings come from not understanding right division and following the traditions of man. While some teachings of history and of men might be interesting, helpful, and insightful, they are not above the Word of God and authority. We can't lean on them for our understanding. And fifth, this work is my witness. I don't proclaim to have everything figured out, but what I am sharing I believe to be the teachings of the Bible. If I learn that what I believe is wrong, I will share new information about what I've learned from the scriptures and what it said in the scriptures to change my position. If you believe me to be an error in what I teach, don't be a jerk. Reach out to me with the spirit of Galatians 6 in mind. Uh, restore me with a spirit of meekness and be open to discussing what the Word of God says. A good question to ask yourself is, would you be more satisfied from the interaction that you and I have if you proved yourself right, or would you be more uh, satisfied with that interaction if the truth of God was illuminated for you? And if that's where you're at, then we're aligned. Go on ahead and shoot me an email. My email address is tinylifebigmission at gmail.com. That's the best way to reach me. And if you are wanting to know how to support the work that we do here, there are four easy ways that you can uh, help us. and. They won't even cost you one dollar. First way that you can help this ministry is to share our videos um, with those who you know who need the Word of God. Second is like this video if you found the content helpful. Third is subscribe if you haven't already, and you can update for notifications as well if you like. But most importantly, we ask for your prayer. We pray for you every week. Uh, the, the Bible says in James 5.16 that the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And uh, we believe in the power of prayer and we, we desire your prayers. We need them. So please pray for us. We are currently still in the series of 
the most important doctrine of the Bible. And if you haven't watched the last couple videos, I highly recommend that you start at the beginning of the series because each video will build on itself as you go through the series. So far in the series, we've talked about what God is so that we know what it means to be made in the image and likeness of God. Once created in God's image, God tested his creation and man failed that test. We know that God told man that if he ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, in the day that he ate of it, that day, that very day, he would surely die. Now, man ate of the tree that he was commanded not to eat of, and that very day, something in him changed. He was no longer in the image of God, but rather in the image of man. The difference being that God is a living body, a living spirit, and a living soul, and Adam's spirit died. He still had a living body and a living soul, but he was no longer a living spirit. So he was no longer in the image of God. The scriptures say, so death entered in by sin, and all men since Adam were born in Adam's image, spiritually dead. We read in Jesus' teaching that all men must be born a second time, which is a spiritual birth, and this week we look at how to be born again. I gave a warning at the start of last week's video, if it's in the word, then it's right. All the Bible is truth, but you must rightly divide the truth that is written for you from the truth that is not. Another way of saying this is, is that all the Bible is the word of truth from God, and all of the Bible is written for you, but not all the Bible is written to you. There are divisions in the Bible, and these divisions in the Bible separate different kingdoms and peoples, as well as the statutes that God requires them to follow. If you truly want to understand the Word of God, you must learn to rightly divide. Throughout history, there have been more than one means that God has required from humans in order to be saved. It is important to understand what salvation is in the current age in which we live, and that is what we will be discussing today. We last left off with me saying that you cannot lose your salvation because it is based on Jesus' faith, not on our faith in Jesus. People have struggled with this concept, and I don't think that we will get to it quite yet in this video, but we are going to open up the concept in this series, and we will dive into the topic a lot as we move through the doctrine investigation. Just so I don't leave you hanging, though, there is scripture that says that Jesus is faithful all over the Bible. Uh, in 1 John 1, 9, it says that Jesus is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all our unrighteousness. This is key. And many teachers who are deceived go about deceiving others, just as Paul said would happen in the end times. But we will uncover this truth by simply looking at what the Word of God says and just reading what the Bible says. The point of this video is not to uh, discuss right division, but I open the topic to dis demonstrate it here. And we will certainly unpack it more as we move through the investigative study. The reason for this demonstration is several fold. First, it is to show that God has had several different plans for salvation for humans over history. And second, it is to demonstrate how God only ever uses one plan at a time. Now, what I'm about to show you will not prove this point emphatically. It is just introducing it here so you can understand it better as we dive into this doctrine. We will prove it from the scriptures and videos to come. Um, and to some extent in this video as well. Um, so let's just dive into the, these two passages and we will compare briefly the differences so you can see what I mean here. So let's first open up our Bibles to John 3 and we'll look at verse 14 and 15. Now this is still in John 3 where we've been through most of this series. We looked at how Jesus was approached by Nicodemus and he told him about how he needs to be born again and then he kind of went through and explained that. And then Last week, we looked at the end of this chapter where John the Baptist gives a testimony about Jesus. But right now, we're going to jump back into what Jesus said. Because Jesus was telling Nicodemus how to be saved. And, and he jumps, this is kind of midway. You can go back and read it for yourself. It starts in verse 10 and goes all the way through 21. We already talked about it in a previous video. But the scripture reads, As Moses had lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. The Jews are different from the Gentiles. Our minds work differently. The Bible teaches us that the Jews require a sign from God to believe him. The Gentiles do not. Now, it doesn't see, say that the, the Jews like a sign from God or that they want a sign from God. It says that they require a sign from God. So the Jews will not believe without God giving them a sign. So God gives them signs. He always has. Uh, you can see it clearly throughout the Bible. 
Moses led the children of Israel through the wilderness for 40 years. God gave him all kinds of signs. Some were privately just to Moses. Some were to show the children of Israel. Some were to show Egypt. And some were even to show all the other heathen nations of the world. God is not working in signs right now because right now God's prophetic timeline is not working to restore Israel, his earthly people. God has put Israel on pause, so to speak, and has turned to the jealous uh, to the Gentiles in order to make them jealous is what the Bible teaches. In times past, the way God provided for his people to be saved was different than it is today. In verses 14 and 15, we see Jesus talking to Nicodemus about salvation, and Jesus is teaching the gospel of the kingdom. The giveaway here is the signs. The serpent being lifted up is a sign for the Jew. This sign was an important sign for the Jews because it showed them that God had not forsaken them for their iniquities. All the Jew had to do was look up at that sign that Moses had lifted up and God would spare their life. Just as the serpent was being lifted up by Moses as a sign for the Jews back then, so is Jesus for the Jews as well but only to those who believe in him. This is where false teachers get the gospels confused. Both the gospel of the kingdom and the gospel of Jesus teach that you must believe in Jesus. The difference is what you believe in Jesus as. The true Christian will believe in Jesus as fully God, fully man, who, temp who was tempted with sin just as we were here on this earth, but yet lived without sin. Jesus paid for all of our sin, not just Christian sin. He paid for every sin that was ever committed in the whole world by sacrificing himself and shedding his blood on the cross. Now, not all of that shed blood, not all the payment for the sin is imputed on everybody. You have to accept it, but the blood was shed whether you accept it or not. Jesus proved that he was God by raising his blood depleted body from the dead on the third day, just as the scriptures had prophesied. We believe in Jesus as the risen God from the dead, as Christians. When Jesus was teaching this message to Nicodemus, Jesus hadn't died yet. In fact, there was no expectation for Jesus to die. They didn't see the scriptures clearly because, first of all, they were so far apostate, they weren't even reading the Bible. I shouldn't say none of them were reading the Bible. There were still people reading the Bible, but the, the people who were actually studying the Bible and reading the Bible were very, very few. But second, at that time, not all scripture had been revealed yet. It's easy to look back from where we stand now, now that everything's been revealed and have understanding about the whole scripture that they didn't have. So the Jews didn't expect their Messiah to die. They expected him to set up a, a kingdom that would last forever and that he would rule and reign with um, a rod of iron and that he would be the Lion of Judah and they were expecting a war, not his death. What Jesus was teaching Israel was the kingdom of heaven was being offered to the Jews. God sent himself as Jesus to restore his chosen people to himself. What Jesus taught the children of Israel to do was to be baptized, repent of their sins, and accept, or in other words, believe in Jesus as the prophesied Messiah and coming king. This is why Jesus was performing all the miracles. The New Testament calls Jesus' work signs and wonders, and it's because the Jews required a sign. Now let's compare this with the, uh, the gospel that the apostle to the Gentiles taught in another passage that I told you to grab, which is 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. Now before we start into reading, I wanna to call to your attention that in this study, I've mostly been teaching these two different doctrines from John 3 and from 1 Corinthians 15 throughout this whole series. Um, where I was at in Corinthians was the later verses in chapter 15, but now we're going to go to the very beginning of chapter 15 and start at the beginning of the chapter, and it will come to light here real quick. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. We see here that Paul is declaring unto you the gospel by which that he preached. So we can see that this is a gospel. And if you study what the Bible says, the Bible defines that word of gospel as good tidings, good news from, from God. If you look at it, it actually says that in Psalms. We see that this is, is a gospel that he's declaring unto us. And he says, by which ye have received, wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved. So we know that this is the gospel by which we are saved. Lastly, in this section of scripture, you can see where Paul says, lest ye have believed in vain. So you see that it requires belief. And the difference is, is 
what one must believe in this particular dispensation versus the, the previous dispensation. Now let's go on ahead and keep reading verse 3 and 4. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again on the third day according to the scripture, Scriptures. Before I expound, I want to call out what Paul says here. He says he is delivering here, quote, first of all which I also received. This gospel is the first of many revelations that Paul received from Jesus. In his other letter to the Corinthians, Paul talks about the abundance of revelations that he had received in chapter 12. It is not my point to run out all these scriptures, but we will develop this point in time. Right now, I'm just setting the stage, but Paul said the mysteries, plural, given to him were from Jesus and that they were hidden Christ before the world began. These are all distinctions of what he calls his gospel. And the fact that he calls it his gospel is also a distinction that separates it from the rest. The reason Paul said that these mysteries were hidden in Christ is because if Satan had known God's plan, he never would have crucified the Lord Jesus. It was through the Lord Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection that Jesus is able to defeat, defeat Satan in the first place. Now back to the teaching of this gospel, you'll notice that there are two passages here that, say, that Paul says according to the scripture. He says it in verse 3, according to the scriptures, and then in verse 4, according to the scriptures. The reason Paul states it this way is because he is painting a picture that supports all his teachings to include right division. The word Christ simply means prophesied Messiah and King. Christ was prophesied in the Old Testament. It was prophesied from the Garden of Eden that God would shed his blood to make atonement for his people here on earth, even though that prophecy wasn't fully revealed for thousands of years. But you can see Christ's prophecy all over the Old Testament. It, it, it just goes constant through the Old Testament. Now, Paul is making a connection to Jesus and the Old Testament prophecies involving Messiah by the authority of Scripture. And then in verse 4, you see that Paul mentions buried and risen again on the third day, and he also says, according to the Scripture. Now, when Paul wrote this letter to the Corinthians, the New Testament wasn't completed yet. And the Jews did not regard the New Testament as scripture because the Jews didn't regard Jesus as their Messiah. So here, Paul is making a connection to Jesus and what God revealed to Paul as the first revelation given to him by the authority of the scriptures. So he's connecting the New Testament and his writings with scripture and pulling the two together. Interesting. This demonstrates a separation from the old gospel and the new one revealed. In fact, over in Galatians 2, you can see where Paul has to go over and correct Peter, James, and John, who were all at that time teaching the gospel of the kingdom. This also demonstrates that Paul's writings were the word of God because the Bible refers to them as scriptures. The reason why he teaches so emphatically is because if you follow the wrong set of instructions, then there is no salvation. You must believe in Jesus as God that he died to pay our, the price of our transgressions just as the Bible teaches or there is no salvation. A lot of teachers will stop the gospel here, but the truth is that the message of the gospel continues into verses 5 and 6 as well. And then he was seen of Cephas and then of the twelve. After that he was seen above 500 brethren at once of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. What this is saying is that when Jesus rose, he was seen of Cephas, that's another name for Peter, um, and then he was seen of the twelve, so the twelve disciples. Now, if you know anything about the twelve disciples, one of them was cruci or not crucified, he hung himself. Judas Iscariot, he betrayed Jesus, and, and in his guilt for betraying Jesus, he went and hung himself. And so, it's interesting to see that Jesus showed himself to the twelve, but one of the twelve was dead. Now, Matthias did uh, replace Judas in Acts, um, and it's not my point to kind of go through all that, but I wanted to call out here that Jesus was seen of all these people, and it says to up to over 500 brethren at once. And most of them, Paul writes, are, are still alive today, but some have fallen asleep. That means some have died. And the reason why he pointed this out was because there was still witnesses alive. He was writing to the Corinthians to tell them, this is true. Believe it because it does require belief. And so Jesus made himself available to not only his 12 disciples, but all kinds of people and uh, up to over 500 brethren at once. And the Bible gives pictures of Jesus letting people handle him and see that he is indeed in his flesh and uh, 
he, he did rise from the dead. The big question that is asked throughout all history is, was Jesus really God, and did he really rise from the dead? This verse openly states that he did. You can see this echoed in Acts 1-3, where the scripture records Jesus showed himself by many infallible proofs. Now, just to blow your mind, and, and I'm going to give you a little something to steady out there in Acts 3 here in just a second, but just to blow your mind, if all this is new to you, the time that when Jesus was here on earth, but after he was risen from his dead, while he was showing himself to everybody, uh, the, where it says up to five, over 500 brethren at once, at that time, what Jesus was preaching was the kingdom gospel, <laughs> the gospel of the kingdom. Um, it wasn't the gospel of Jesus Christ yet, even though Jesus had died and resurrected. This, the, the kingdom was still being offered to the Jews. And we'll, we'll look at this as we continue to study this out, but it wasn't until after Stephen was stoned and Paul was converted to Christ that the gospel of Jesus Christ was revealed and began to be preached. Again, more to come, but uh, let's look at now a second witness of this gospel because if I teach you that you need to have two witnesses and so we want to make sure that we follow those rules. But before we do, I want to give you a little uh, opportunity here to take a screenshot of this cross-reference if you want to get started in your own personal study and study this out. Words matter and their meanings matter. I encourage you to study this out. Why am I so emphatic about the King James Bible? Here's one uh, sample verse. If you look at Acts 1-3 and you compare it in the King James compared to other versions of the Bible, you're going to see some changes made and those changes impact the Bible's doctrine dramatically. Let's see if you can find them. For a second witness of this gospel, let's go on ahead and turn to Romans chapter 10, verse 9 through 18. As we read here, you're going to see that there are two things that are required for salvation. We'll read through uh, verse 9 through verse 18 and expand kind of as we go, but then we'll come back to pull out what must happen in order for one to obtain salvation. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart the man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whoso believeth on him shall not be ashamed. A couple things to note in verse 10 and 11. In our previous text, we saw that there were two times where Paul said, according to the scriptures. And here we see another connection to the scriptures, and we also see the connections in this passage as well to belief and salvation. The truth is these three things are connected. We cannot know what to believe without the scriptures and we cannot be saved unless we believe. Think about this. How can we know about Jesus but by what the word of God says? How can we believe on him if we don't have his word? Paul will demonstrate this a little bit better here a little later and he calls it out because it matters. Let's go on ahead and keep reading in uh, verse 12. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? So in verse 12 we see that this gospel, that there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. They are both saved the same way. This gospel isn't to the Jews only, like the gospel that is taught by Jesus in Matthew 10, verse 5 through 7. This gospel includes the Gentiles. Yay! <laughs> we get in! There is a division between the gospel that Jesus taught and the gospel that Paul taught. These verses say it all. God is a God of mercy and God wants all men to be saved. The Bible says it over and over that God gets no pleasure in the death of those who are lost. God is a God of love, but God is not only love. God is also a God of wrath, just as we saw last week in John 3, 36. God is also a God of justice, and as a just God, if you don't obey his laws and statutes, his justice will reward you according to what you deserve. You don't have to face that judgment. All you have to do is believe in the word that he has written for you and do what it tells you to, to do to be saved from that judgment. All you have to do is call upon the name of the Lord Jesus and you will be saved just as it is written in the scriptures. How shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. But we have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. But I say, 
Have they not heard? Yes, verily. Their sound went into all the earth, and their words into all the ends of the world. Now, I hope that by reading this all together, it helps you see what I've been saying. As a side note, it's interesting to me that when you share the gospel with people, how many people ask you about the heathen in Africa, or the pygmy in Papua New Guinea, or whatever. And what if they, their question is always, like, what if they haven't heard about God, and then what? And Paul clearly states that this gospel has gone out to the whole world in verse 18. Paul teaches it in Romans that God has revealed himself enough to all creation that all people are without excuse for their judgment. It is crazy to me, and this includes myself because I'm no better than anybody else. I was in a lost state just the same as the rest of the world is in a lost state. But it's crazy to me that people want to deflect their convic con convictions by pointing the finger at somebody else. In this passage, it teaches that deflecting will not hinder God's judgment. Let's start expounding in verse 9 so you can know how to avoid God's judgment. In verse 9, we clearly see the scriptures state that there are two things that must happen. First, we must confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus. Most people may not know what this means because most people don't know that God's name is Lord. If you don't believe me, look it up in Jeremiah 33, chapter, uh, verse 2. Um, by giving Jesus' name, the title, the Lord, it is identifying Jesus as God. This gospel teaches that you have to confess Jesus is God with your mouth. This gospel does not teach you that you need to confess anything else other than the Lord Jesus. So some denominations will teach you that you have to confess your sins or your faults or other things. Not true. That's men adding to the Word of God. And when they add to the Word of God, they make the Word of God of none effect. There's also an implication or assumption in this text that how you come to know Jesus as God is through His Word. Last we see here, we must believe in our heart. Before we talk about what it is to believe in our heart, we need to unpack a concept that is way too big for this late in the video. I may have to do a standalone video showing the differences between the meanings of the words believe and faith. I encourage you to study this out for yourself, but without showing you any scripture, I can summarize the study to say that faith is taking God at his word. That's what the Bible paints the picture of the word faith to mean, is taking God at his word. Believing is accepting a concept you don't necessarily understand, but you accept it nonetheless as truth. It's a form of trust. If you dive into studying what the word faith means, you will see that it Technically, faith cannot be applied to anything that is separate from the Word of God because it is taking God at His Word. So you can't have faith of Muslim faith because God didn't write a word for the Muslims. It's taking God at His Word. So faith is connected to the God of the Bible. And what you'll also see in studying it is that faith requires action. In Romans, you can see where Abraham's faith was counted unto him as righteousness. Now, this will freak some people out but faith is a work. You cannot be saved by any works that you have done. So <laughs> when James says uh, that faith without works is dead, this is what he means. We cannot be saved by our faith because if, if we were saved by our faith, that would be a work. And the Bible clearly states that we are not saved by anything that we do. It's none of our works, which we have done. We are saved by Jesus's faith. His faith is demonstrated in the work that he was sent to finish. And he did finish it because he is faithful. So back to verse 9 and the second requirement of salvation that we see. We already looked at the first, and that is to confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. So the last, you must believe in your heart. That means in your core, in your soul, in the very center of your being, that God raised him. That him is referring to the Lord Jesus, meaning God raised himself from the dead. And it is according to the scripture because there is no other resource that we have here on earth whereby we can know our creator. The only way that we can know our creator is by his word. And that is why the version of Bible matters so much. When you change words, you change meanings, you change cross references, you change doctrines. And just as Jesus put it, the word of God becomes of none effect. Now I've said it many times, but salvation really is this easy. Right now, salvation is the easiest it has ever been, and it is the easiest it will ever be. Because this is the only dispensation that is based on grace through faith, not by works. Every other means of salvation that has been and that will be will always require works. 
If you are doubting the salvation that you have experienced in the past, or if you are not sure if you are saved, it doesn't matter. You can take care of it right now. It's super easy, it's free, and the two requirements are just the requirements that we just discussed. That is all that is required for salvation. So believe in your heart that God came to earth, died as a man for your sins, and raised himself from the dead to save you, and you're halfway there. The next thing is to say out loud, the Lord Jesus is God Almighty, and boom, it's done. And it doesn't matter if you felt tingles, it doesn't matter if you got goosebumps, it doesn't matter any of that stuff. There's no tricks to it. You don't even need to understand what just happened to you, but that's where we're gonna pick up next because that's all that we had time for this week, and I hope to see you next week in this word. Hey!